with an estimated 60,000 clients across 100 uh, countries and around the globe. Uh, the De Vere Group is regarded as the largest independent financial consultancy group in the world. Four years after establishing a point of presence through offices uh, in South Africa, De Vere Africa has become the fastest growing area within the group's global operations. Craig Featherby is responsible for keeping De Vere's African operations on track and he's our captain of industry tonight. Thank you so very much, Craig. Great to have you on the program. It's great to be here, actually. So as I say, um, Africa, one of the biggest and the fastest growing areas for the De Vere Group. Take us through uh, the demographics of your clients on the African continent. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, ultimately, we have three types of clients. Um, the world is getting a, uh, becoming a smaller and smaller place. Um, expatriates from around the world are finding themselves working in and around South Africa, in Angola, in Nigeria, in Ghana. Um, and it's the, 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 the group's intentions to ensure that we can provide a global financial presence. Um, really, uh, uh, it's following the McDonald's philosophy, a, a Big Mac in Shanghai should taste the same and look the same as a Big Mac in Johannesburg. So looking at the, not only the South African operation, but also the Africa operation, it made sense. Um, I think Africa is where uh, the Far East was maybe 25 years ago. Um, it, it's, it's now the time for Africa. We're excited about Africa and Africa represents a, a big opportunity for us. You only came to Africa in 2008. Yes. Some would argue that that is very late. Why 2008 and obviously synchronized with the financial crisis? Um, very, very good question. Um, I guess I've been traveling the world for the last eight years and in positions in Kuwait and Dubai and, and Japan. And um, we finally got the opportunity to look at Africa. Um, and yes, possibly it was slightly late, but bearing in mind our business is in the pension transfer business. Um, people need to retire. People need to save and invest money. So yes, there was a financial crisis in 2008, which we're all obviously... Um, I'm assuming you came into Africa prior to the financial crisis. Um, it was just, just, just at the beginning. <laughs> so it was a, a very, very um, interesting time for us, especially coming out from a very, very buoyant society in Tokyo in my last posting. Um, but looking back over the last four years, we've raised um, probably in excess of, of 5 billion rand worth of private client assets. Um, we have 14 offices in Africa. Um, we are the fastest growing region in the group. And currently we have 200 financial advisors representing the brand across the region. It must have been tough though handling the financial crisis given the fact that there was an erosion of wealth across the board. Pension funds also. Uh, we hit very hard. Yeah. Tell us about some of those challenges that you experienced over that time. Um, I think it, it, it always comes down to uh, the trust and the security of the assets. Um, De Vere being a brokerage um, managing eight billion dollars worth of private client assets, it gives us a unique ability to, to, to climb into the institutional space with the institutional players. So we have strategic partnerships with such as JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Royal Bank of Scotland, and very, very recently, we're going to tie up a deal with Goldman Sachs. So yes, whilst these banks um, uh, still represent risk for our clients, we need to make sure that our clients are uh, protectively uh, supported through the, the tough period and making sure that their assets are sitting in the right type of structures. And, and the main names that you mentioned were very much the names that were embroiled in yep. uh, the CDOs, the toxic assets. Absolutely. Um, I mean, did you have clients that were exposed? Um, to those uh, toxic assets? No, no, we didn't. Um, because bearing in mind, we were in the pension business. So the pension business must be very, very low to risk. Um, but these uh, were regarded as triple A, some of the, uh, yeah, absolutely. the instruments that um, were created. They, they were. And, um, you know, if you look at what's happened in the world today and, and, and exactly what's happening in the investment business today, I think you've got to be very, very careful. So what protected you over that time that you didn't actually have uh, customers and consumers that were uh, exposed to those toxic I think, assets? Um, just a very, very, very smart compliance team out of Switzerland, um, possibly a bit of luck, um, which, which was great. Um, we've, we really, really have maintained our presence, maintained our asset book, and it grows by to the tune of between 30 and 50 million pounds on a weekly basis. Give us an indication of um, the assets that you are more prone to investing in. We know that pension funds, even though they are very low risk, they also have quite a high exposure to equities. And we know what equities did during yeah. the financial crisis, despite the fact that uh, things are looking better uh, right now. They still have an element of risk attached to them. Yes, they do. But let me just make a, a very, very clear point. Our core business is the transfer of UK frozen pensions mm. into what we call a QROPS, which is a qualified, recognized overseas pension scheme. 
Um, globally, there are a trillion pounds worth of assets which are eligible to be transferred into a Curops. Now, the pension legislation in the UK is somewhat different to what it is here in South Africa. In 2006, the European Union got together and um, decided to reform the pension industry, and that industry basically bore the, the, the creation of a CUROP in the 6th of April. So therefore, my clients get the ability to transfer what is a frozen pension, um, which will effectively die with the individual, through to a, a Guernsey-based or a Malta-based or an Isle of Man-based retirement annuity trust and have 100% access to their funds upon their death for their beneficiaries. What kind of trends are you seeing uh, within Africa? I mean, you mentioned the likes of Angola and Ghana as well. We started to see a lot of money uh, to and from from the African continent. And again, let's look at the demographic um, you know, scenario that is playing out with your customers. Are they mostly expatriates? Are there um, locals wanting to take money out yeah. of Africa? Well, firstly, on Africa, when I made the decision in June of 2007 to um, give up my position in Tokyo, managing a very, very successful team, um, uh, everybody laughed and they said, Craig, you're giving all that up to go and set up a brand new operation in Africa. Um, unfortunately, people's perception, perceptions of Africa is there's lions and tigers still running around on the streets. I've never been more encouraged about the opportunities that we have, not only here in South Africa, but also the opportunities that we have in, in West and East Africa. Um, looking at the types of clients, well, category one, an expatriate. Um, an individual living and working in a country where we have representation that is earning euros, dollars um, and wanting to basically look after their long-term financial future. Secondly, here in South Africa, there are a lot of obviously individuals, um, elderly individuals that have previously taken money overseas. They want obviously uh, local representation here. They want somebody to hold their hand. So with our network of offices throughout Europe, we're able to build, provide that level of service. And then finally, um, I think after 2008, people are starting to realize that contributing or saving and investing 100% um, of your assets in South Africa may not be the best thing to do. Uh, South Africa contributes less than 1% of global GDP. Therefore, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to diversify your assets, not only also in currency, but also in asset class. And teaming up with a, a group such as De Vere with the size that we have and the opportunities that we have, we really, really strive to um, really get them to achieve their financial goals. Okay, so we know that in 2008, people became a lot more conservative, especially when it came to their pensions. Yep. Here in South Africa, we're starting to relax some of the uh, compliance pension and, legislation, and pension, yes. legislation, pension legislation, exactly. And there's also a fear of taking money overseas, despite the fact that the RAND is quite strong. How do you get across a lot of these perceptions that you experience in South Africa? Well, the, 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 the South African economy has done exceptionally well, as we know. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, it, it comes down to education. It's educating clients on uh, the necessity to diversify. Um, why would you want to have all your assets? Why would you want to be employed by a company, save in the country, save in the currency? Um, what happens to South Africa? I don't know. Nobody actually knows. So therefore, I think it's generally, generally good, good investing sense to start diversifying your portfolio. So it comes down to education educating your clients on the basis of De Vere here. We've been around for the last 10 years, four years here in South Africa and, and Africa. We're going to be around for the next 10, 15, 20 odd years. We're going to be here to hold your hand through the, both the good and the bad times. Okay, well, take, take us through some of the bad times as well. I mean, when you first came in 2008, I'm sure that business was relatively low. Very few wanted to take money overseas. Yeah. Is that right? It, it was. It was a very, very trying time for us because, um, funny enough, we didn't have any competition. Um, and when you enter a market where you're a, a, a brokerage that solely, solely invests in pension type structures in the offshore market, um, people would look at you with some degree of um, concern. Not only that, the regulators, the Financial Services Board, I think are doing a fantastic job. Um, but equally so, it's educating them on the basis of what we're doing. So we've worked very, very hard in getting both the regulators and our clients to, to trust us and understand what we do. But we work even harder now to maintain that level of trust. So I guess coming back from an offshore sector, um, working in, in the Middle East and the Far East, and then coming back to South Africa, understanding the perceptions of South Africans. Do you think we're far more conservative than what you've experienced overseas? Well, by far, by a million miles. And what do you think makes us so conservative? Do you think that it's the cost of capital? Do you think that it's the banking system as a whole? What do you think makes South Africans far more conservative? I think we're just told that from a young age. Um, and we're told to be conservative in the decisions that we make. 
um, overseas. Uh, our clients would make decisions very, very um, quickly. Here in South Africa, the decision-making process is a lot longer. Um, we work hard for our money, we know that. Um, there's obviously areas of inflation and there's political um, concern, concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think we're just generally conservative people, which I think is a good thing. Um, I mean, when you look at exchange controls and the, the abolishment thereof, yeah. the move to abolish exchange controls completely, this obviously must be working in your favour. Um, absolutely. Purely because when I first came to the country, it was, um, I think it was 750 in a lifetime. Uh, then it, it shifted to 2 million. Now it's obviously 4 million per year. Um, so for all intents and purposes, it has been lifted. Um, will, it, will it be lifted 100%? I think it will. Um, and therefore people... How, is this a game changer for you though? It is, yes. It absolutely is. It gives us, it gives us our ability to, to tap into uh, a, a higher... Um, uh, in, you know, the, the wealthy of the, uh, of the local society. Um, people that are wanting to expose themselves um, to, to foreign assets. What is your experience though? Is there a, an intense appetite to diversify even further into foreign assets given the fact that the RAND is still at very attractive levels? Um, once again, it comes back to diversification. It comes back to um, continue doing your own investing. You know, I too invest heavily into South Africa in both property and, and equities. There are some fantastic opportunities. Um, but do I have 100% of my assets in, in RAND based economy? No. Um, so therefore, I think there will always be a, a story behind overseas investments, getting involved in the, the China boom, getting involved in the India boom, and making sure that your assets are always going to be completely protected. What kind of risk does the RAND have, though, for those wanting to um, invest overseas? We know that when the RAND is weak, <laughs> investment is low. Yep. So I'm sure you're hoping that the RAND is not going to weaken from these levels. Um, yeah, the unfortunate reality is, is when is the right time to take money overseas? Um, somebody once told me that it's never going to drop down below eight and a half dollars. I mean, eight and a half rand to the dollar. Well, look where it is today. Um, so, uh, yeah, when, when is the right time? Um, do we want it to drop further? No. Um, do we want to capitalise on opportunities to utilise the exchange control um, limits? Yes, of course we do.